good gardening is grounded in the soil. And we're here today in Franklin at Red Thread Farm, which is actually a micro farm. And the owner, Jeremy Tolly, is a professional at soil. I try. <laughs> Certainly a lot of the practices that we have here could be applied to any garden anywhere. Absolutely, and, and let's talk about that because we tend to overlook it, but it's the foundation of a good garden. Right, I think we wanna come out and till ground, put seeds in, and, and hope and pray things go well. It feels when good to till it does, sometimes. It does feel that, feel that way. In fact, when I was a kid, I can remember being in my grandparents' garden and seeing that freshly tilled soil. And so in my mind, I've always had always equated that with, this is good, healthy soil. But in fact, that tillage breaks down the microorganisms and the structure of the soil. So you go back to that same garden bed, what was once nice and fluffy after a heavy rain, it's compacted, right? Right. Because you're destroying all the, the fungal network and all those beautiful things that are in the soil. So here on our farm, we do not till. We, we practice low soil disturbance. As little as we can get away with, we use a broad fork, uh, sometimes to reduce compacted soil, which is just like a large pitchfork. So right. one of the ways to help, re to help reduce compaction, like carrots or some type of root vegetable you want to make sure has plenty of soil depth to go into, is to simply take a, um, a fork and go into your soil a little bit and just lift it up slightly uh, without having to turn the soil over. Okay, so, so let's look at this, Jeremy, because okay. I've, I've never stumbled onto perfect soil. Neither have I, So, except maybe in a forest floor. But correct, correct, and we don't usually garden there. Correct. So, so what do we need to do to start with? If we're a beginner gardener, what do we need to do to start with to ensure that we've got a good foundation for our garden? Sure, so most people are gonna have a garden plot that's already established, and depending on the where you're at in the state of Tennessee, you're gonna have very different soil types. It might be sandy, it might be clay, it might be rocky. The, the key for any of those soil types is really the addition of compost. So this is a bed that we had planted with a, with a cover crop of buckwheat in the summer, and we've come back as we always do, and we've added a layer of compost. You see this dark compost? Yes. This is a very um, low nitrogen plant-based compost from our city. So this is leaves that have been collected at people's homes and they've been composted in a professional facility. We bring that on the farm and it just creates a really nice soil structure. You can overdo compost if you're using uh, manure-based compost. Uh, with, with this, you really can't overdo it. We apply it on the top. We don't till it into the soil. We allow it to work its way into the soil. Got so if, if I stick my hand in here, my, I could go all the way up to my elbow in beautiful soil because we've continued to do that after every single crop. So uh, the homeowner could easily do that as well just by clippings and um, even this from their fall displays. Absolutely that they can bust up and, and use it to help kind of cushion their and, and amend their soil all winter long. That's right. Another practice that we use is to always keep the soil covered. So if we don't have a crop growing on the soil, we might put a cover crop on that. And that's just a crop like buckwheat or fescue or something that is gonna be uh, short-lived that we're then going to till, till then or turn that under or more than likely we're gonna smother that right. um, in, back into the ground. Another quick way to do that is just by using a mulch. Uh, not only does it help to improve the structure of the soil, but it also suppresses weeds and it conserves moisture. And then this hay over the winter, will the bottom layer of it will decompose into the soil and add more structure to the soil. So um, honestly, who doesn't improve with nutrients? Correct. We yeah. improve, the soil improves. It's, it's just getting the right balance there to make sure that it's fed properly. That's so right. I love using plant materials versus manure-based compost for that very reason, because we do tend to think more is better. We do, and we want to fertilize the soil. We want to put something on it that's really strong to give it a dose of medicine, when what we need to do is to feed the soil and continue to do that throughout the growing season, throughout the year. So after we've established our garden, um, we tend to get into habits and you know, the corn always goes here and the okra always goes here and the tomatoes. What, what do you say about that as far as uh, moving things around in the garden? Yeah, that's a great point. You really want to practice 
crop rotation. Where um, And there's books that you can get on this. You can get very scientific about it. Or you could just be simple, and which is more the way we do it. We just don't plant the same thing year after year. There are some crops like tomatoes that you want to skip a couple of years. If you have them planted in a certain part of your garden, don't plant them again in that same part for the, for the next couple of years. And even in a very small space that's not measured and laid out like all of these beds, you can do that in a small raised bed just by putting some markings on the edging of your bed and then creating some little quadrants. So if I grew in quadrant one, if I grew tomatoes there, I'll grow lettuce there the next time or I'll grow carrots in that spot. To, constantly rotate what crop you're growing at what place in your garden. And that's kind of like a um, like a booster shot for the soil, don't you think? It just kind of, I mean, we all get bored with the same stuff, even the soil gets bored. So it's, uh, at some point it gives it something new to interact with and to, and to help feed. It does that. It also helps to reduce pest pressure. Right. So if you have a, there are diseases and there are insects that feed off of particular plants. And if they know to expect that plant's going to be there year after year, you'll find that the disease pressure and the pest pressure will build up over time because you're not rotating those crops. You've gone to all this trouble with your soil and you've started growing what do you use as spray, if anything? Pests can be really discouraging when you've gone to all that trouble, you've worked the soil, you've planted things, and you come back and you see things like these aphids on this rutabaga leaf. So the, what we think is the easy thing to do is to go to the hardware store and get some sort of chemical and spray on that to kill these bugs. And, and it will do that, um, but it actually, um, there's a lot of nasty stuff in those chemicals, and we avoid those chemicals if at all possible. So having good soil health will help to reduce pest and disease pressure. Um, good crop sanitation, rotation, all those things we've talked about. But then simple things like a soap, a diluted soap solution. Even just a dishwashing detergent diluted with a tablespoon and a, and a gallon of water sprayed on these aphids would kill those aphids. And then you come back after a week and spray them again. It's a non-toxic, completely safe and harmless substance that will then break the cycle of the aphids. That's an example. And then sometimes if we have a large pest pressure, we'll just eliminate that crop. We'll decide right. not to grow it again. Or we'll pull that crop out or we'll harvest it early. And then instead of composting that diseased or, or pest filled um, plant, we'll move it far off the farm so that uh, we can try to eliminate that. Because all those chemicals do leach down into the soil. And so it's, it's not just the moment you're spraying, it's an everlasting thing that permeates the soil. Absolutely. And not only are you killing the bad bugs like the aphids, but the ladybug is and lacewings are known predators for these type of things. And you're killing them as well. So what happens, you might get an instant gratification. It's like eating a chocolate bar. You feel really good in the moment <laughs> and, and you're taking care. You're getting that fix uh, in the same way. Uh, the plant is not going to feel very good after that if uh, you've sprayed it with chemicals and then you get those bugs that come back even heavier after that. Uh, it creates a cycle of spray and then spray more and then spray more and then eventually those sprays become ineffective. Right. It's a never-ending circle that Absolutely. You've, you've created your own problem. That's right. Thank you so much for your knowledge base and for reminding us that this is, this is where it starts and this can make it great. My pleasure. If you like gardening, you'll want to subscribe to our channel. Home gardening tips, tips from growers, and lots of plants. Until next time.